But it is good to be back here with you. Uh, Brother Gary said a lot of nice words about me. I don't deserve any of them. In fact, two weeks after I, or two Sundays after I had my heart attack back in July, he said some very nice words about me that I did not deserve, and he meant them. You said I was a hero. I'm not a hero, but I'll tell you who a hero is. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a hero with so much abundance we can't even express it all. Amen. He, y'all know the, you know the old, old story as we sing it. He came, he loved us. He's our hero because he loved us. I don't stand anywhere near his statue. I'm like a speck of, of sand on the beach. I'm like a speck of sand on, on a beach on the earth as compared to our sun, if I'm that much. Because he is our creator, he's our Lord. He's, he has loved us and he loves us with a gracious love that we will never understand. But anyway, thank you for those gracious, kind words you said. Thank you all for allowing me to come again and be with you here at Beards Creek Place. It's, a, it's not the only Bethel spot, but it is a Bethel spot. I'm glad it's just, it rejoiced to be able to come. So this morning, I wanted to look at a passage of Scripture, and y'all have probably read it more than I have. And what I want to talk about this morning, if, uh, if I can give it a title, is Workmanship of Grace. So if you want to follow in my reading, I, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. And I plan to read down through verse 10. And the Apostle Paul writes there, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and, in, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in high places in Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the riches, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, not, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them love that passage of scripture. Will you pray with me? Lord God, our Father, we come before you this morning bowing our heads to, to acknowledge your greatness, to acknowledge, O oh Lord, that thou art above us. Lord, you're on your throne, and it's such a high and lifted up throne, so much higher than we can even imagine. And as we humble ourselves before you, Lord, we ask that you hear our prayers, hear our praise, hear our thanksgiving. Lord, all that we have, all that we are, all that we will ever be is through you and through your precious son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you this morning that we're able to come into this house, that we're able to worship together again this day. So we pray you can meet here with us, O oh Lord, that, your, that our worship might be in spirit and truth, and it all be to your glory and to your praise and to the, and to the praise of Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name I pray and ask forgiveness of our sins. And amen.
So evidently this morning, I'm going to talk about grace. But I want to tell you, whenever I get in, get get into the mode or the mind, get it into my mind that I need to speak about great God's grace. Honestly, I go into overload because grace is such, it's an overwhelming topic or subject. As I mentioned in my prayer, everything that we possess as believers in God and Christ Jesus, everything we possess as believers, we have received through God and Christ Jesus. And it's by his grace that we have it. We've received all by his grace. We've earned nothing. We deserve nothing that we have received by grace. We've purchased nothing. We know all that. I'm just reminding you. Everything, brothers and sisters, that we have in Christ Jesus is freely given to us by the grace of the Lord God Almighty through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. God has given us his gift of irresistible grace without cost to us. Now, he does not expect us to, quote-unquote, repay him for his grace because we cannot. However, for those who have received his grace, he does expect, uh, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this right, he does return, expect a return because he has a vested interest in us. I hope I didn't confuse anything there. But the work of grace brings some real changes in the lives of God's elect. <laughs> These changes allow and encourage us to live for God. And our living for him, according to his will, brings glory to his name and to him. And this is a return. This is a return that I was talking about. We know from scripture that God works according to the good pleasure of his will. We see that in Ephesians 1 and 5. And we know that whatsoever he has decreed will come about in his time, not my time, not your time, in his time. We look at Isaiah 60, or excuse me, Isaiah 46, reading verses 10 and 11. Isaiah was inspired to write, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient days, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure calling a ravenous bird from the east and the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. So in God's irresistible grace is declared, well, at least partially in here. And it will in his time again be effectual for every one of his elect children. There's no real resistance to God's grace. There's no real resistance to it. And all who have been effectually called will rejoice in their calling once they have an understanding of what God has done. They will not resist. Not that they could. I can't resist God's grace. You can't resist God's grace. And we will eventually understand and rejoice in God's grace. I hate to refer back to Nebuchadnezzar as he began to understand God's grace and glory while he was out there in, in, in the wilderness with his hair long and his nails long. Because once he gained an understanding of God and God's grace and God's power, Y'all remember what he says. He says, God doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say unto him, uh, excuse me, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? God's grace by his power is irresistible. And for those who have not yet understood it, they will 
understand it to some degree, even as we understand it to some degree, because God's grace, like many things, is still yet a mystery to us. His love, why he should extend his love and grace is a mystery to us, other than we know that he desired to do it. It was his pleasure. So I want to take a look. I want to take a look at, at, at first, part of the first two chapters of Ephesians. I want to look at a few of the facts about grace that we find in Ephesians 1 through Ephesians 2, verse 9. I want to look at what it's done for. So we be, I want to begin looking at verse 3 of chapter 1. Grace, grace gives us spiritual blessings through Jesus Christ. We look to verse 4. It's by grace that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Looking at verses 5 and 11 and 12, grace has determined that we will be like Jesus and we will be with Jesus one day. Talking back to verse 6. Grace has made us accepted in Jesus Christ. Verse 7. Grace, is provide, grace provided the blood of Christ that cleansed us from our sins eternally. I'm going to jump to verse chapter 2 now. Verses 1 through 3. Here we're told that grace reached out to us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And we were headed for eternal separation from God. In verse 4, we find that it's by his grace we are and have been made his beloved. Verse 5 tells us that grace has given us life. Verses 6 and 7 tell us that grace has secured our future. And then those two verses 8 and 9. It's by grace that God has secured our eternal salvation. When grace comes to a dead and lost sinner, that sinner is born again as a new creature in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.17 2, tells us that. And because we're new creatures, our appetites, and our ways of living are laid aside for a new life in Christ. What God works into us by his grace will, will work its way out in our lives. We're not just saved by grace, but we're changed by that same grace. So as the grace of God works itself out in our lives, it manifests itself through our works. God's grace is seen in us because of our works. Now the main verse that I wanted to get to is verse 10. Let me reread that. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. <clears throat> this verse is about the working of grace in our lives. It tells us about what the Lord does in us when he saves us and how he works through us to accomplish his, gift, his will or accomplish what he wants us to accomplish in the world. It's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to all of God's people to be the examples of grace he saved us to be. So today I want to notice some thoughts that we find mentioned here in verse 10. Because, and in it we're looking at the workmanship of grace. I want to begin with the word workmanship. From what I can determine in my little understanding is that the word means that which is made, a work, a work of art. And in this, I believe Paul is speaking of God's masterpiece, that which he has made in his own image. 
man in his original state and of his elect, which had been cleansed and sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. So Paul, I believe, is saying that the redeemed saints of God are his masterpieces, that the saints of God are his greatest achievement in creation. They are, if you will allow me to use this, the work of the master potter. These redeemed saints of God are the results of God's loving industry. We're saved because he took the shapeless dead clay of our lives and he took them into his powerful hands and he has molded us, molded us into something new, something new for his glory. He worked on us with loving care and infinite skill. And he shaped us by his grace and he, and he wrote his love into our lives. 2 Corinthians 5, 5 says, Now he hath wrought us for the selfsame thing as God, who hath given to, unto us the earnestness of the Spirit. The word there wrought in, in that verse 5 means to fashion so we are with his workmanship. He has fashioned us. Now I want you to think about, think about the raw materials that God had to work with when he saves and changes lives. Didn't have much, did he? Didn't have much. Yet. Yeah. Yet yeah, because he used his grace and his power. And he has changed our lives. Because of that, the work that he has produced is far more incredible than we can imagine. And the gospel declares our, the truth of it as we read it. God has loved you. He has saved you by his grace. And you are to act. And we are to act. And we do act. I pray we do act as the saints of God as we should. The gospel, is, the gospel itself is God's love letter to his people. And it has been given to us. And then it, he tells us that he loves us. He tells us just to say in the same way that the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1 and 21, it's addressed to those that he loves. What did it say in Matthew 1 and 21? He shall, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It was his love that saved us. So God's people, his people, are his work. His people or to be his billboard in the earth. And as we're billboards, we should be showing how he has written his love into our lives. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, And this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward heart. <coughs> and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they will be my people. We are to live but <coughs> excuse me, I can't get rid of this call. We are to live by what he has written in our hearts. We are his works of art. It doesn't matter where, whether we are structure, whether we are painting, whether we are, are writing. We are not to be behind a closed door. We're not to be hidden in closets. We're not to be contained in the four walls of this meeting house. <coughs> we are to be his work of art. And we are to be on display for all to see, be seen by our good works. Our good works show God's work in us. We are to demonstrate God's work in us and be a testimony to the world that God does save sinners. We are to show, we are to, to share that workmanship. We are to show the artistry that God has worked in our lives and what he has created us to be. 
I read an illustration of God's work, and, and well, I didn't actually read it. I read the quote, and I'm going to share the quote with you. So I'm quoting a, a, a gentleman named Kent Hughes. It says, Michelangelo was once asked what he was doing as he chipped away at a shapeless rock. He replied, I'm liberating an angel from this stone. Kent Hughes goes on to say, that's what God is doing with us. We are in the hands of the master maker, the ultimate sculptor who created the universe out of nothing, and he has never yet thrown away, on, thrown away a rock on which he has began his masterpiece, end quote. So now I want to back up, and I want to look at the word created in verse 10. It means to form or to shape. It refers to making something out of nothing. It speaks of a new thing. When a child of God is born again, he becomes a new creature. He becomes that. He's changed from one that was dead in his trespasses and sins. And he becomes new in the eyes of God and new in Jesus Christ. I believe that outside of the birth and resurrection of Jesus Christ and maybe creation itself, <coughs> the new birth is the greatest of all miracles. And it's the greatest demonstration of God's power. As each child of God is born again, we become something that has never before existed. Each of us is a new creation. We've never existed before as a child of God, as a born-again creature. Looking at 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new, <coughs> new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So as new creatures, we're the result of the effectual calling or the irresistible grace of God. And every child of God is to walk, talk, act, think, and live differently than previously because of the grace of God. We are to be a bold and powerful witness to the supreme workmanship of the Almighty God. We look now at the words, in Christ Jesus. These words remind us that Christ is the cornerstone and the cornerstone upon which our salvation rests. Looking at Acts 4, 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you, builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among us whereby we must be saved. We, we here, gathered it here to preach, and all who have ever been born again or who will ever be born again are new creatures who are to be testimonies unto, the, unto God's life-changing power. We're to be examples and we're to be <coughs> and we're to be examples of the master craftsman's workmanship and that he has taken something that was without worth. We were without worth and he has made he has made you and I a treasure unto himself. Genesis 1 starts its in the beginning. But as we read these, these verses in, in the first of Ephesians, it seems like there was something before the beginning. Before the beginning, God had a plan and it was not restricted to eternal salvation. Notice this in, in, that, in, in verse 10, the next phrase. It says, unto good works. It says there, God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Good works. Now, we know that good works do not save, but they are a product. It is a product of the gift of grace. It's a result, if you will, of, of if you will, of salvation. 
Good works by the child of God are, are evidence of our salvation. Again, our walk, our talk, our fruits show God's presence in our lives. Paul writing to the church of Galatia says this in chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the, with, with the afflictions and the lungs. Then I want to turn to the words of Christ in the Sermon of the Mount. On the Sermon of the Mount, as he speaks about the reconciliation of fruit as compared to the false prophets there in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 17. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth, bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. We are to be those good trees. Our fruits are to be those good fruits which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, I don't understand that the Apostle Paul is inferring that our good works are some type of special event. It's not a, a, a one majestic event. It's not something that brings you worldwide attention. It's not something that would bring you any type of affirmation. Not something that would get your name in the newspaper. Our good works are works that are to be included in our everyday lives, in, every, in all of our activities. In our daily walk with the Lord, we are to consciously make use of the opportunities which come before us and that our walk is to be, our walk in these works is to be a fixed way of life. Our lives are to be committed to, to living as we walk, following the example of Jesus Christ as he walked in there on the earth. So for those who have received God's irresistible grace and for those who will receive it, how are, we to, how are we to walk? John 13, 35 tells us we're to walk in love. Christ says, By this shall all men know you that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. John 14 and 21 tells us that we're to walk in obedience. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. We're also to walk in faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4 and 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And then 1 Peter tells us in chapter 1, 15 and 16 that we're to walk in holiness. But as he, meaning Christ, which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's our lifestyle. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We look at the new birth. And we find that this is an instantaneous happening which begins our sanctification which is the process of changing us on a daily basis to be more and more like Christ. We're not perfect. We're not sinless. We never will be in this life. But the changes that God has made in our lives should be seen as we grow in holiness 
before God and before the world. Our changes. And you may have heard this before. I don't remember where I picked it up. I know I've used it at least once before. I have a little tidbit that reminds us of our condition as we are, again, we are a work in progress. There's a little boy acting up in his Bible study class and his, his rowdy ways were beginning to frustrate the teacher. Y'all had any of that in your Bible study classes? Anyway, she asked him, Johnny, what, why do you act like that? Don't you know who made you? Well, the little boy settled down just a second, about a spout a second, and he replied long enough to reply, God made me, but he ain't through working with me yet. Brothers and sisters, the irresistible grace or the effectual calling of God is the beginning of God's workmanship in our lives. He's not through with us yet. He's going to keep working on us until he calls us home. I'm going to close with this passage from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes there, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And may we continue to show God's show forth the good works that God has before ordained that we were to walk right here. To be any this morning who have a desire to profess their love of Jesus Christ and unite with this church and worship God and serve him here at this place, we ask you. Make that desire known this morning as we sing. Hymn number 482. Hymn number 482.